Hey guys, today we have a special bonus episode for you about the story of a man named Khalif Browder. Myself and a few other podcasters have teamed up to discuss this truly heart-wrenching story and hopefully to spread some awareness about some of the bigger issues that revolve around this case. This story begins in May of 2010 in the Bronx in New York City. Khalif Browder was 16 years old and he was just 10 days away from his 17th birthday. And one night he was walking home from a party with a friend. As they strolled down the street of Little Italy in New York City, a cop car pulled up in front of them, and then another one, and another one. And before they knew it, Khalif and his friend found themselves surrounded by policemen and blinded by blue and red flashing lights. An officer approached them and said they received a report about a robbery. Khalif and his friend were in disbelief, and he told the police that they hadn't robbed anybody. The officers then searched both of them, but found nothing. So they walked back to their car and spoke again to the alleged victim who was there himself. Then, moments later, the officers returned, but this time they had a brand new story. The victim now claims that he wasn't robbed that night, but instead, two weeks earlier. Khalif and his friend were completely confused and again pleaded their innocence. Before they knew it, both teens were in handcuffs and riding down to the police station in the back of a squad car. Khalif Browder was then interrogated by police and a prosecutor, but he continued to maintain his innocence. But all that didn't matter. With no proof of any wrongdoing, the police charged him anyways, with robbery. And because Khalif's family couldn't afford the bail, he became stuck in jail, indefinitely. Before he knew it, he was on a bus to Rikers Island, the most notorious jail in America, with a long history of violence and scandal. Khalif Browder would remain here for three years. And mind you, he wasn't serving his sentence. He was literally just waiting for a trial. Khalif Browder was innocent and he stood up for himself and refused to take their plea bargain, which could have released him earlier. But instead, they made him stay in prison, where he endured beatings by corrections officers and other inmates. And all that was caught on surveillance video. And for two of those years, Khalif was forced into solitary confinement. And finally, after three years, they decided to release him. Their case against him was baseless, and they knew it. But a 16-year-old kid had to endure three years of mental and physical abuse in solitary confinement in one of the most dangerous prisons on earth for a crime that he didn't commit. I'll let Rabia from the Undisclosed podcast take it from here. I'll be joining the discussion later in the episode. In 2010, Khalif Browder was a 16-year-old black high school student from the Bronx walking home from a party when he was arrested for allegedly stealing a backpack. Not for any violent crime, but for stealing a backpack. He then spent an unthinkable three years on Rikers Island without ever being convicted of a crime. To be clear, these were just charges. He was never convicted of this crime. But still, he languished in prison for three years, 400 of those days in solitary confinement. He was starved, beaten, and brutalized in prison before charges were eventually dropped and he was released. Browder's story became national news in 2013 when he brought a civil rights lawsuit against New York City, the New York Police Department, the Bronx DA, and others for $20 million, claiming physical and emotional torture. His fight for justice brought to the forefront of public consciousness numerous issues, including juvenile detention and solitary confinement. Tragically, he never won that fight. The demons that haunted him from those years at Rikers drove him to his very young death. On June 6, 2015, 22-year-old Khalif Browder committed suicide by hanging himself in his Bronx home. It wasn't the first time he had attempted to take his own life. He had tried to kill himself six times previously, beginning when he was incarcerated at Rikers at the age of 16. Khalif's story was widely reported in the New York region, but many around the country and the world may not have heard it. Famous rapper and music producer Jay-Z is aiming to change all of that. He's teamed up with the Weinstein Company to tell Khalif's story through an incredible, gut-wrenching six-part documentary series soon to air on Spike. Jay-Z calls Khalif Browder a modern-day prophet and his story a failure of the judicial process. 
And for those of us who have previewed the documentary, which recently premiered at the Sundance Film Festival, where the Daily Beast called it the best documentary coming out of the festival, well, we have to agree with that sentiment. Time, the Khalif Browder story, premieres March 1st at 10 p.m. on Spike, but the podcasting teams at Undisclosed, Truth and Justice, Actual Innocence, and Up and Vanished have all had a chance to preview this new series, and today we come together to tell you all about it. Thanks to Law & Order, Rikers Island may be the most famous jail in all of America. It's on an island in New York between Queens and the Bronx and connected to the mainland by a long, narrow bridge. Violence and corruption have been endemic there for years. It's so bad, in fact, that not long ago, the Department of Corrections had entered into a consent agreement as a result of a class action brought by former inmates due to the widespread abuse they suffered at Rikers. As described by a U.S. attorney in a cover letter to the court, the agreement will require the New York City Department of Corrections to develop and implement myriad new practices, systems, policies, and procedures designed to reduce violence in the jails and ensure the safety and well-being of inmates. The reforms mandated by this agreement are designed to comprehensively address systematic deficiencies that have plagued the jail system on Rikers Island for years. The 63-page agreement calls for a wide range of reforms intended to dismantle the decades-long culture of violence in the city jails and create an environment that protects both inmates and correction officers alike. Many of the provisions in this consent agreement are aimed specifically at how Rikers handles minors. Kids like Khalif, who, along with hundreds of other teenagers, was held in solitary on the island. In 2015, the Board of Corrections voted to end solitary for all inmates 21 and younger, and in October of last year, the measure was finally implemented in full. But when Cleef was at Rikers, the use of solitary confinement as a means of disciplining teenagers was routine. The evidence against Cleef in this case was painfully thin. The Spike documentary makes a convincing case that there really wasn't any plausible evidence of his guilt for the backpack robbery. Just a flimsy eyewitness ID that came a couple weeks after the crime had been committed. But it's hard to shake the feeling that the question of Khalif's guilt or innocence is almost irrelevant. Because what happened to him is inexcusable, regardless of whether he did it or not. In some ways, it feels like examining the question of whether he was guilty would almost be a way of justifying what happened to him. Then again, Khalif's supported claims of innocence do seem relevant in one very real way. If Khalif had been guilty of the crime, if he had stolen the backpack, then maybe he'd have been more inclined to take a plea deal, and in doing so, could have saved himself from spending almost half of his teenage years on Rikers Island. But Khalif said he was innocent. He wouldn't take a plea, and so he wouldn't go home. And for me, what happened next erases the weight of the question of his guilt or his innocence because, again, even if he had been guilty, that wouldn't provide any kind of justification whatsoever to what he went through. A stolen backpack or any crime can never warrant torturing a teenager for three years with solitary, held without bail, and with a trial that gets delayed and delayed for all kinds of reasons, but with the result being that Khalif didn't get to go home until he was 19. Outside of Rikers Island, the way the legal system handled Khalif didn't seem cruel on its face necessarily. There wasn't any indication of hostility from the lawyers and other court officers and policemen and policewomen shown in the film who interact with him. There's no sense of hostility towards him in particular, no real sense of malice. In clips and recounted stories, the way the court system handled him and the way the police handled him, it seems clip of professional, a sort of brisk formality that conveys, well, let's not make this any more unpleasant than it has to be. For me, the most chilling is probably the woman who interviews Khalif after his arrest at the police station. She sounds friendly almost when she's questioning Khalif in a small room, the clock ticking away behind him. Khalif's clearly confused about why he's there, about what he's accused of doing. 
And she cheerfully asks him questions with a sort of friendly indifference to Khalif's actual situation. Although there's no malice in her tone whatsoever, no judgment, it's clear she's handling Khalif just like another cog in the system she has to process through, asking her list of questions and moving on to the next. The fact that the story she's asking him about seems to make no sense doesn't seem to cross her mind. The same sort of tone reemerges years later, in a sterner form. In the deposition that Khalif went through, years later after his release, and after he brought suit against the Department of Corrections for the nature and conditions of his confinement. He was deposed, and the attorney for the defense, doing her job, quizzed Khalif about every aspect of his life that might provide some grounds for justifying what was done to him. And she forces him to give a series of answers to all kinds of details that are clearly designed in the hopes that they could be used later as a defense, or at least an excuse for why New York had put a 17-year-old in solitary for such a long period of time. You were adopted, is that right? You were suspended from school? Some of your siblings have been in trouble before? And on and on. And of course, the defense attorney in the civil suit already knows the answers to all these questions. They already know what they need to get Khalif to say in order to make his story fit the portrayal that they need in the hopes of lessening the possible damages in a civil suit. And they know all these answers because Khalif had been under the state's eye since literally before birth. Every move of his was recorded, every shortcoming added to his file. Everything he had done in his short life was there at the state's ready for them to use against him anytime the state needed it to shore up a case. Whether the state was acting as a prosecutor in a criminal case, or as for Khalif, since there was no criminal case ever and all charges were dropped, when the state's acting as a defendant in a civil proceeding, trying to find evidence that Khalif somehow justified the abuse he went through. And while it's not a focus of the documentary, in an era where politicians at the very highest levels have been talking about resuming the stop and frisk policies of the old days, the documentary's visceral discussion and depiction of the impact of that policy seems more important than ever. Khalif didn't just have his whole life monitored and every incident available at the state's command for use in either civil or criminal proceedings. He, along with millions of others, was subject to the state's arbitrary use of force to detain and pat him down by officers of the state who were in search of a crime at random. Well, almost at random. After Khalif's arrest, he bucked the system. He refused to go along with the routine processing that boys like him are supposed to go through by pleading out, admitting to guilt to a crime, and having their case resolved one way or another. Khalif refused to accept the plea, though, and the legal system responded by simply shutting down on him. Can't go to trial, too many scheduling issues, can't get bail, there's a hold. For Khalif, it was off to Rikers for three years, while the gears of justice caught up to the fact that he hadn't pled out and he hadn't processed himself out the way he was supposed to. And once at Rikers Island, the legal system seems to have forgotten him. Instead, the prison system took over. Life at Rikers for Khalif and for thousands of others was horrific and violent. The video clips of the fights that went on, of the beatings that Khalif endured, are hard to make sense of. They're clear, mostly, in that they show mostly what's going on, a top-down view of huddled fights in narrow hallways, but at the same time, they're confusing to understand, mostly because of the actions of the guards. I kept re-watching those clips, trying to figure out what was going on in them, but I couldn't reach a clear answer. Were the guards trying to stop the fights, trying to break up the groups of other kids who were trying to beat up Khalif? Or were they just aggressively watching it, just trying to look like they're busy? There's a weird sort of half-heartedness to their efforts to break up the fights that seems striking when juxtaposed to all the violence around them directed at Khalif, especially when Rikers is notorious as one of the most dangerous places, both for inmates and correctional officers. Despite this, the CEOs wade into the fights with a bored and unconcerned air, and they halt the assaults against Khalif at a leisurely pace.
there's nothing damning about those videos necessarily of the group fights. Nothing you could point to and say with absolute certainty that yes, the CEOs are encouraging those fights between the inmates. But at the same time, they do leave a clear impression of something not being right here, of something not being done to protect the kids the way that it should have been done. Whether the CEOs were involved or apathetic or acquiescent, whatever it was, something wasn't right there. And there's other videos too that don't have any kind of ambiguity like that. The violence at Rikers isn't just between inmates. In another video, one in which no other inmates are around, Khalif is being led down the block by a CEO. He's cuffed, the officer is holding his hands, walking him down the hall. And then suddenly, with Khalif doing nothing against the officer but saying a few words, possibly from the video, but certainly no physical actions taken by him, the officer suddenly throws him against the railing, and then onto the floor, and then up again and down again, holding him against the ground. And the whole time, Khalif shows as much resistance as a rag doll, not fighting the guard at all, despite the violence against him. And for this incident, Khalif was given more time in solitary, with no administrative hearing, just a medical report noting that he'd gotten injured from hitting his face against a shower wall, or maybe from an alleged use of force by staff. That's all it took to send a teenager to solitary. The 2011 report of the Human Rights Council on Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman, or Degrading Treatment or Punishment defines solitary confinement as, quote, physical and social isolation for between 22 and 24 hours each day for one day or more. The practice of solitary confinement originated in the early days of the American Republic when the Quakers constructed the first penitentiaries that were intended as a means of encouraging self-repentance and reflection for criminals. In creating these prisons, the Quakers designed individual rooms for solitary introspection, but eventually abandoned the idea of solitary confinement after observing the detrimental psychological effects of prolonged solitude. But the rest of the country didn't follow suit. According to testimony by Professor Craig Haney given to a Senate subcommittee, an estimated 80,000 of the 2.3 million inmates in U.S. prisons and jails are in long-term solitary confinement. And that number doesn't even include the similar practice of administrative segregation, which was most recently before the Supreme Court in the 2015 case, Davis versus Ayala. Uh, has he spent time in solitary confinement, and if so, how much? He has yeah. spent his entire time in what's called administrative segregation. When I visit him, I visit him through uh, glass and wire uh, is, is that a single cell? Uh, it is a single cell. They're all single cells. While San Quentin is on the most... It's, it's, on heaven's land in Marin County, it's a 150-year-old prison, and their administrative segregation is single cells, a very old system, very small, um, and and is that the same thing as solitary confinement? No, it's 23 hours out of the day. That probably is the same. They generally administrative segregation. You're not allowed in the general yard anymore. Um, but you are allowed an hour a day. One hour. Effective. The Ayala case wasn't initially really about administrative segregation or solitary confinement, but Justice Kennedy decided to address it in his concurring opinion, noting that, quote, there are indications of a new and growing awareness in the broader public of the subject of corrections and of solitary confinement in particular. As support, Justice Kennedy cited to the case of Khalif Browder. At Rikers Island, where Khalif Browder was housed, an average of 100 teenagers are in solitary confinement each day and are routinely placed in segregation for months at a time. Moreover, 41% of the individuals in solitary confinement at Rikers Island's Central Punitive Segregation Unit are mentally ill. Browder himself was in solitary confinement for about two years. While numerous contemporary studies have confirmed the Quakers' initial conclusion that solitary confinement causes psychological damage to the isolated, the effects are even more pronounced in the young. Studies have consistently shown that juveniles suffer the greatest psychological damage from solitary confinement because their brains are still developing. Recognizing this, on January 25, 2016, President Barack Obama penned an op-ed piece for the Washington Post announcing an executive order banning almost all use of solitary confinement for juveniles in federal prisons. The president began his article by relaying the story of Khalif Browder. President Obama's executive actions ban solitary confinement for juveniles and low-level offenders held in federal prisons. Writing an op-ed in Tuesday's Washington Post, Obama cites the tragic case of Khalif Browder in New York City. Browder was 16 when he was accused of stealing a backpack. He spent three nightmarish years at Rikers Island without ever going to trial. 
and during that time he spent more than 400 days in solitary confinement. Browder killed himself. The question, of course, is whether state prisons will follow suit. 196 out of the 197 member nations have ratified the UN's Convention on the Rights of the Child, which prohibits the use of solitary confinement for juveniles. The United States is the one exception. Beyond human rights, though, there are other reasons to abandon or at least reduce solitary confinement. According to Sticker Shock, a 2014 report from the Justice Policy Institute, New Jersey spends $537.35 per day and $196,133 per year to incarcerate one juvenile at Jamesburg or Bordentown, which both extensively use solitary confinement, and the New Jersey Juvenile Justice Commission has a recidivism rate of 80%. Conversely, Mississippi recently abandoned the use of solitary confinement and has concluded that it saved approximately $8 million annually and reduced violence levels by 70%. When a defendant has been arrested and is waiting for trial, the judge must make the difficult decision of where to set bail, the amount of money the defendant must post as collateral to ensure he'll appear for court dates. In addition to precluding the imposition of cruel and unusual punishments, the Eighth Amendment also prohibits the requirement of excessive bail. Several lawyers have claimed that the Eighth Amendment, as well as the Federal Bail Reform Act passed by Congress, mean that a judge cannot set bail at an amount the defendant is unable to pay, most famously in the Supreme Court case, United States v. Salerno. As to Vincent said, I, that excessive bail violated the Eighth Amendment. I, I believe uh, that uh, that's exactly what Stack versus Boyle dealt with, in particular when it related, as this case must also bring to the court's attention, the fact that one of the most important rights, forgetting about obviously the harsh penalties we're talking about here, the loss of liberty, there can be no harsher imposition on individuals in our society, but. In addition to that, we have a situation where, as in Stack versus Boyle, Chief Justice Vincent pointed out, the right to bail in these circumstances is, circumstances is necessary to enable someone to fairly meet the prosecutor's challenge. And without that opportunity, I submit to the court, there is a drastic difference between what an individual may uh, be prepared to submit himself to. I, I believe uh, that uh, that's exactly what Stack versus Boyle dealt with, in particular when it related, as this case must also bring to the court's attention, the fact that one of the most important rights, forgetting about obviously the harsh penalties we're talking about here, the loss of liberty, there can be no harsher imposition on individuals in our society, but in addition to that, we have a situation where, as St in Stack versus Boyle, Chief Justice Vincent pointed out, the right to bail in these circumstances is, ne circumstances is necessary in to enable someone to fairly meet the prosecutor's challenge. The Supreme Court and lower courts, however, have always taken the position that there's no right to bail at an amount that a defendant can afford to pay. And given that 80% of defendants in this country qualify for public defenders, that's led to the pretrial detention of hundreds of thousands of defendants charged with nonviolent crimes. According to the ACLU, on Rikers Island, nearly 40% of jailed individuals are incarcerated because they cannot afford bail. Khalif Browder is one of those individuals. He was incarcerated for three years pending a trial that never occurred because he couldn't post the bail amount of $3,000. New York and Rikers Island aren't alone in this experience. According to a recent report by the Vera Institute called Pass Due, in 2015, government agencies in New Orleans collected $4.5 million in revenue from bail, fines, and fees, but ended up paying $6.4 million to jail defendants who couldn't pay their bail, fines, and fees. This report came on the heels of a groundbreaking amicus brief filed by the Department of Justice in Georgia in the case of Maurice Walker. The Justice Department is making it pretty clear. It is very serious about criminal justice reform. This time is keeping up its fight against fixed cash bail amounts in state courts. Fixed bails can make it hard for poor people to pay before their trial, so they end up sitting behind bars until their actual court date. The DOJ said this practice violates the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. In a brief in a federal 
Federal Appeals Court. The department said, quote, although fixed bail schedules appear to be neutral on their face, the Supreme Court has explained that policies that impose sanctions on only indigent individuals are not neutral in their operation. The case in question is that of Maurice Walker in Calhoun, Georgia. He was arrested for a misdemeanor and spent days in jail because he couldn't pay the $160 fixed bail set by the city. He sued, and a federal judge ruled in his favor, telling the city to let people arrested on misdemeanor offenses be released on their own recognizance. The city appealed, saying the bail amounts are allowed under state law. This isn't the first time the department has spoken out against fixed bail amounts, but it is the first time it has done so in a federal appeals court. The Obama administration has been ramping up its attempt to clean up the criminal justice system for years now. Along with fighting against fixed bail, the president has commuted more people's prison sentences than the previous seven presidents combined. On top of that, the DOJ recently decided to phase out for-profit prisons by not renewing contracts over the next few years. Walker was charged with a misdemeanor crime of being a pedestrian under the influence with bail set at $160. Walker, however, has a serious mental health disability and a limited income from Social Security disability benefits and couldn't afford that bail amount. The Department of Justice challenged Georgia's cash bail system that allows cases like this. The DOJ's argument wasn't made under the Eighth Amendment, but instead under the Due Process and Equal Protection Clauses, alleging that cash bail systems in effect punish the poor for their poverty. In the final portion of its brief, the DOJ noted the deleterious effects of pretrial detention, inability to prepare for trial, loss of a job, and disruption of family life. The brief notes that these effects are felt even more severely by the poor who are already in a vulnerable position. Finally, the brief notes that, quote, of the more than 730,000 individuals incarcerated in local jails nationwide in 2011, for example, about 60% were pretrial detainees, a rate unchanged since 2005, and most of them were accused of nonviolent offenses. Both of these conditions, pretrial detention and a nonviolent offense, were the case for Khalif Browder. But again, there's hope for change. Recently, the Court of Appeals of Maryland unanimously approved changes to the Terrapin State's bail system. Right now, new this morning, pretty soon, people in Maryland will not be allowed to be held in jail simply because they can't afford bail. Maryland's highest court, the Court of Appeals, unanimously approved the change to the state's pretrial system. It will go into effect on July 1st. The change comes after hours of testimony last month. In October, Maryland Attorney General Brian Frosch urged that an individual's ability to pay be considered when setting bail. Now, this change doesn't preclude a judge from ever setting bail an amount beyond the financial means of a suspect, but it does make ability to pay a primary consideration. And hopefully, these and similar changes mean that individuals like Khalif Browder aren't detained due to their lack of financial resources. The Sixth Amendment guarantees defendants the right to a speedy trial. In the 1972 case, Barker v. Wingo, the defendant argued that the Supreme Court should interpret this right as establishing a short and fixed deadline for holding a trial based on the following reasoning. The speedy trial provision, as this court has held, in each speedy trial case brought before it, pre, or pre-trial anxiety, hostility in the community, loss of jobs, curtailment of associations. There's even more of a specific pretrial prejudice. The Supreme Court disagreed, concluding that the question of whether this right to a speedy trial has been violated must be demonstrated on a case-by-case basis. In the absence of explicit guidance from this country's highest court, many states have stepped in and passed their own speedy trial laws. New York's version is known as the Ready Rule. This Ready Rule requires that all felony cases, excluding homicides, must be ready for trial within six months of arraignment, which is when the charges are read out to the defendant in court. This might make it seem like defendants will have their day in court at most half a year after they're charged, but the problem is that the six-month clock can stop for any number of reasons, including the defense filing motions before trial. Moreover, the Bronx courts are so congested that when an attorney asks for a one-week adjournment, the next court date usually doesn't happen for six weeks or more. Thus, every time a prosecutor requested a one-week adjournment in the Khalif Browder case, he got six weeks instead, but this only counted as one week against the six-month deadline. And Browder's not alone. In 2011, 74% of felony cases in the Bronx were older than six months. And the same applies for misdemeanors. Here's WNYC reporting on a current lawsuit regarding the delays in scheduling of misdemeanor trials in the Bronx. 
The nonprofit Bronx Defenders is claiming the judicial system is so dysfunctional it violates the U.S. Constitution's right to a speedy trial. The group cited data showing people arrested for misdemeanors in the Bronx, like drug possession and trespassing, can wait almost two years for a trial by a judge and even longer for a jury trial. Federal Judge George Daniels with the Southern District Court rejected the state's argument that he should dismiss the case because New York's Chief Justice and others are working on solutions. But there's hope. Early in 2017, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo announced the New York Promise Agenda. As part of his New York Promise Agenda, Governor Cuomo is calling for a comprehensive set of reforms from arrest to trial to ensure equal justice, he says, for all citizens, ensuring access to a speedy trial, and overhauling New York's antiquated bail system. Here's the substance of what Cuomo is proposing. Quote, the governor is advancing legislation which will reduce unnecessary delays in adjournments in court proceedings. The proposed legislation require that people held in custody, not only their attorneys, consent to a speedy trial waiver that must also be approved by the judge. These waivers will only be granted after the detained defendant has made an appearance before a judge. All speedy trial waivers will be required to include a deadline so that the defendant defense attorneys, prosecutors, and judges understand when the trial is scheduled and do not allow delays in the case to clog the court's calendar. Hi, it's Rabia here, and I am joined with a entire panel of amazing podcasters who um, we're just going to have a panel discussion. We all got to preview this fantastic documentary series, and I'm going to let my um, co-panelists introduce themselves now. Hi, I'm Bob Ruff, and I'm the host of the Truth and Justice podcast. I'm Payne Lindsay, and I'm the host of the podcast Up and Vanished. I'm Brooke, and I am the host of Actual Innocence. Thank you guys so much for coming together to talk about this. You know, we've been I'm going back and forth, and as we watched the preview episodes, a number of issues kind of struck all of us, and they're kind of the big, glaring, systematic things that we see in a lot of these kinds of cases, but specifically, and you know, Bob and I separately spoke to the producers and uh, filmmakers about this. They remarked that, you know, one of the biggest tragedies of this case is like how many things went wrong in it, right? There was like the system failed Khalif Browder on so many different levels. So um, there's four or five big issues that we want to talk about, and um, we'll open up for discussion. Bob, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, the first thing that that I noticed in watching this, and 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 as being the you know the straight white Midwestern guy, uh, all the stuff at the towards the beginning where they're talking about stop and frisk, I've noticed through through this case and and through others how much of a misconception there is out there. So, so, you know, I, I'm surrounded by other white people here in the Midwest and what I'm realizing and having discussion with my friends after I've been working in this field for so long is the misconception that people have about things like stop and frisk. So my friends are not, I don't have, you know, obviously racist friends, but there's an institutional racism that comes in there where we just don't understand what it's like to live in that world. And one thing that I thought the documentary did a great job of of showing us is what it's like to be, you know, a black kid like Khalif, you know, living in a, in a part of town where you you can't go for a walk with your girlfriend without fearing the police stopping and throwing you against a wall and frisking you. For me, what I noticed in these discussions was that that a lot of people that don't live in that world don't see it as a bad thing. They see it as if they're not doing anything wrong, then what's the big deal? They get frisked and they go about their business. And if they are doing something wrong, then they deserve to get caught. And that makes sense on paper. But one of the great things that I think this documentary does is to kind of give us a little more insight into the world of what it's like to actually live like that. Well, can I just say there are three white people on this panel, correct? <laughs> right now. <laughs> right. Yes. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I'd be interested in hearing um, from the other two white folks. I have a great story. And actually, Rabia was there. Rabia and I um, were coming home from the Undisclosed live taping. And we were in this Uber with an African-American driver. So I'm I'm the only white person in the car. And I say, I talk about a time that I got pulled over. And the police wanted to search my car. And I said, yeah, sure, no problem. And the Uber driver was like, no, 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 no. Like, you gave up all of your rights. And I think he thought I was being naive because I said, sure, go ahead and search my car without any issues. But now that I look back on it, I think that if someone else had been driving through the Midwest in the car that I was in, that it wouldn't have gone so smooth if they didn't look like me. Right. And I have an even crazier story that happened here that really 
it, it, it's little things that happen in life that make you more aware of the different worlds that exist out there. And so this is it's it's an embarrassing story. So my producer Mike and I uh, oftentimes will engage during breaks in work in airsoft wars around my neighborhood, uh, which is airsoft? silly. <laughs> yeah, airsoft. It's the like the plastic BBs. We shoot at each other to take out our frustration from working in a twelve foot Bob, by sixteen foot room. I, I just want to stop you right now and tell you that if I did that, I would be arrested for like um, basically practicing for jihad or something. Just so you know, but keep going. <laughs> what well, exactly? It's a dangerous game to play these days. <laughs> Imagine this pain. So I'm I'm standing in my front yard holding what appears to be a full-size real sniper rifle and one of our local cops pulled up to my yard while I'm standing there holding oh my, my rifle God. and looks at me and I just turn back to him like, "Oh hey, uh, we're, we're just we're just Did playing airsoft." <laughs> no, because I was being shot at. So, so I I literally just oh tur- I literally just turned to him and and said, "Oh god, sorry, we're just playing airsoft." And, and he says, okay. And he chuckled and said, carry on and drove away. And it just occurred to me, like, how would that have went down if I was a different race or in a different neighborhood or both? Like, I'd be, I'd probably be dead. And, and that's a big thing. And I, it, I, I guess I'm having a hard time articulating that to me. But the frustrating part to me in a conversation I just had with a very close friend of mine a couple of weeks ago who was kind of talking about what I do. And he literally said to me, you just do this work where you try to get guilty black people out of jail, right? Oh, my God. Yeah. And, and, and it, and it wasn't – it wasn't – he wasn't saying it, like, vindictively and nastily. He he was just – literally, that is his understanding. And it just hit – and actually, my wife, Becky, was there with me, and she's like, oh, my God. She, she actually said, after that conversation, I finally understand how important it is what you're doing because that's how people think. And 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 it's not – it's not like I hate black people or I hate Muslims. It's, it's, and it gets kind of perceived that way, but that's really not what it is. It's just really that they have just no understanding because so many people, especially in like middle America, just don't live in that world. Yeah. There's never, they, they have not ever encountered, and they ne- probably never will encounter that kind of reality. Um, one of the, you know, uh, there have been a lot of, lot of activism, um, and advocacy against stop and frisk, particularly in New York City, but even in other parts of the country. And stop and frisk, uh, by its legal name is known as a Terry stop. And, you know, yes, I'm a lawyer, but I don't have a criminal law background. That's not what I ever practiced. And I've been doing research on a, on a different case. And one thing I learned not too long ago about the legality of Terry stops, like when you can determine whether or not a police has done a lawful Terry stop, there are certain requirements, uh, is, for example, if you have somebody who makes eye contact with a police officer and does something called fleeing unprovoked, like he just sees a cop and runs, an officer can stop that person under a certain conditions. Number one is like if the officer fe- fears for the safety of himself and others who are out in, in the vicinity. But the second is this, and this is a requirement, that action had to have occurred in something called a designated high crime area. Well, I mean, guess how those designations happen. They happen often through the testimony of, of law enforcement itself. They happen mostly in urban black neighborhoods. So you, if you happen to be a law-abiding person living in a you know, high crime area, which is likely to be an urban black neighborhood, absolutely not a suburban white neighborhood, you already have one strike against you. Even if you're passing through or you live there, you already are like, you know what I mean? Like you've already met one prong of that law to allow the officer to do that. And so that was really shocking to me. And I realized like how deeply entrenched these systematic issues are because it goes back to even how we do those des- designations and that's different for different places. And, you know, Bob, I understand, I totally understand what you're saying about people not understanding like why it's considered problematic. I mean, we've heard about driving while black forever and flying while Muslim is what happens now. But the thing people have to understand is like, you know, human beings deserve dignity too. Yeah, you you feel a real sense of indignity and humiliation as a person of color. And, and it doesn't matter whether or not you're doing something right or wrong. In fact, if you're doing something right, I mean, if you have nothing to hide, you feel even more humiliation at these kinds of policing practices. So, and, and you can't really put a price on that, on, on the price of human dignity, but it's very demoralizing. Kids get arrested on a charge. They're offered probation. They take it. They don't realize how serious it is. Now you're kind of tagged as a problem. And every police encounter you have after that, you'll be viewed as that kid who has a record, whether you've even been convicted or not. 
Uh, I want to move us into the next issue um, because, like, chronologically, I mean, what happened in the story is, you know, so Khalif was stopped and um, basically arrested. He, they did stop and frisk. He was accused of stealing this backpack, and he was uh, charged with, with stealing it, actually. And then that took us to, you know, him being eligible for bail. And bail was set in this case for the allegation of the backpack being stolen, and the bail was $900, okay? A couple of questions here. First of all, $900 doesn't seem like a lot of money, but for many, many working-class folks, that is a lot of money. They, you know, people who live paycheck to paycheck, and I have been in that position. Even as a lawyer, I've been a single mom. I have lived paycheck to paycheck when I... Like, like I remember one time my car broke down and I needed exactly $900 to get a fix. I didn't have it. My dad had to give it to me. I mean, like it happens and I was a single mom. And so it took Khalif's mom two weeks to get that $900 together. But uh, by that time, they had figured out that he actually wasn't eligible for the bail because he had violated his probation from the earlier truck theft. And I know, Bob, that you... You had serious like questions about like how could he violate probation in this cir- circumstance? Well, you know, I, I've since found out that technically this is the way it works, but it's ridiculous to me. And also the the viewpoint people have that if someone was arrested and that they're in jail, that they've done something wrong. But in fact, by definition, you're you're sitting in jail. You've been arrested because you're awaiting trial, so you're not guilty of anything. And in Khalif's case, and it turns out this is the case all the time. So Khalif was on probation from this joyride in, in this truck from months or years before. And so he was on probation. And so when his mother finally went in and said, okay, we have the bail money. We're going to bail him out. His bail was then denied because he was not eligible for bail because he had violated his probation. And my question is, and if someone can please explain to me how this is okay, how could he possibly have violated his probation? You violate your probation by committing a crime. There was no proof, nor was he convicted of committing any crime, yet still that was considered to be a probation violation because he was arrested with no proof. This is like my biggest problem with probation in general is that one of the rules of probation and they tell you is that once you're on probation, do not get arrested. It does not matter if you were guilty of something or not. They assume that if you were in a situation where you get arrested, then you technically violated your probation and you're you're going to get in a lot more trouble and i i completely disagree with it yeah it just makes no sense to me like like how do you not get arrested like in khalif's case he had no control over this he didn't commit a crime he didn't do anything wrong right. But he got arrested. Like, so how does a yep. probation officer tell you don't get arrested? I mean, it raises a lot of issues about like just even like how we what we think about the system. And I've said this for years now, you know, the idea that in the criminal justice system, you are innocent until proven guilty is a great idealistically. But pragmatically, that's not at all how it's perceived or even how it works, because in this case, in many cases, that arrest triggers an assumption of guilt. Right. And he's treated like a guilty person. Well, I just think that, you know, you you are supposed to have the presumption of innocence. And by having a bail, you know, $900 is a lot of money to me. I mean, I live paycheck to paycheck. And so I think that making a bail that is like out of someone's means to pay is really hard because then they can't aid in their own defense. Like, how do you meet with your attorney if you're in prison? Like, you don't have any control over that. I think the whole issue of bail is it needs to be looked at and re-examined. People are sitting in jail for years, legally innocent, but awaiting trial. Their crime is that they're poor. My bail is $100,000. 50 over 50, I had no bond. $20,000. But I have a $5,000 bail. $1,500. The majority of people who are in Rikers are there because they cannot pay bail of $1,000 or less. One thing I did want to add, and I didn't, I just learned this very recently too, when it comes to the issue of bail, it's been really hard to do bail reform because uh, one of the strongest lobbies, and I never knew this in the criminal justice system, because we always think of mass incarceration, we think of these big private prisons that have these incredible lobbies and they make a lot of money, but the bail bondsman industry is one of the biggest lobbies. And, you know, they make a lot of money. They can charge up to 10% interest for, for providing bail for people and they'll keep the collateral. So, you know, if somebody needs bail money, they don't have it. They don't have the thousand bucks or 500 bucks. They go, they put up all kinds of stuff for collateral. It could be a car. It could be a watch. It could be 
all kinds of things, they will lose that and interest on top of that 10%, which I think is like a monthly thing. And plus the thing is too, it's like whenever you're in jail, you can't just go give them your debit card. Someone has to go pay that for you. So <laughs> you're, you're trapped into having somebody else stop their life and going to pay to get you out of jail and you're gonna have to give them your money somehow so the whole system when it comes to bailing people out is just not it's not easy i wasn't friends with a lot of people in there but i've seen people getting jumped people getting cut there's so much chaos the gang problem is rampant across the island you have to fight for the phone. You have to fight to be able to sit at the table. The officers allow inmates to beat up other inmates. That's part of the program. The program, correction officers accused of running an extortion scheme. Right and wrong is weird in there. Like, what's right to them isn't right. And what's wrong isn't wrong. I smoked cigarettes, liquor, cocaine, razors. You don't want to be on the gang's bad side and the correction officer's bad side. That's hell. I mean, this seems like Lord of the Flies. What's going on here? It's easier to win when you're united. So that's some audio from the documentary that talks about the conditions at Rikers Prison on Rikers Island in New York. It is one of the most well-known prisons in the country simply because it is so notoriously violent and mismanaged and kind of terrifying. We mentioned before, uh, when we were talking about the, the bail issue, what kind of people are being held at Rikers? It's about 10,000 people who are being held at Rikers, and 85% of them right now are actually being held without trial. They haven't been tried and convicted of a thing. So think about it. That's like 8,500 people are being held in these extremely violent conditions. And it seems like if you, with the, the way things work in there, if you didn't go in a criminal, you probably will come out a criminal. A criminal are deeply damaged, right? I mean... You've got violence from uh, gangs. You've got violence from guards. In the documentary, you see Khalif being repeatedly jumped. Uh, when I watch those clips, um, I have a 19-year-old, and this, this kid was 16. He's a baby. To me, he's a baby. And I cried because I cannot imagine, like, my child at 16. You know, w the thing is, when we sometimes look at uh, these folks, like, on TV and the news, they've been arrested, they'll even say, I know, the news will say a 17-year-old man or an 18-year-old man. To me, that's still a kid. And when you look at Khalif, I think he's also, as a 16-year-old and in this system, by the way, New York is one of the few states that still does treat 16-year-olds as adults and doesn't put them in a separate juvenile facility. So they are just surrounded by a lot of danger there. Bob, you had a good point, too, saying that if you're not a criminal and you go into Rikers, you're pretty much going to come out a criminal. And really, after watching the first two episodes of this series, I didn't really know how serious the gang violence and corruption was in jail, especially Rikers. So you have to completely adapt to survive in there. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, it seems like in, in order to survive, you have to form alliances, oftentimes with gang members. And you can't just go in there and just say, I'm going to be I'm going to be straight laced. I'm going to mind my own business and stay out of trouble because you'll end up dead. Yeah, And as a kid, you think that, OK, I'm just going to obey the rules and be quiet and, you know, just know my role, but that's that's really not how you survive in there, which is which is crazy. One of the most heartbreaking things to me was um, Khalif uh, describing his own kind of disillusionment and bewilderment that the guards were not protecting inmates because he didn't know that the guards would just stand by and watch inmates like bloody each other to a pulp, which is what happened to others and to him. And just how much abuse the guards themselves engaged in. And, and again, as a child, I imagine that he thinks these are adults, right? They're going to protect us. But instead, they actually contribute to the violence. I was reading a story, and, and this was a case that was just settled last year uh, with a very big payout, I guess, to the family of this man. But in 2013, there was a mentally ill. I mean, this is how extreme conditions are. Then in 2013, there was a, a man named Bradley Ballard, and he was put into Rikers six days. In, after six days in his cell, he was found dead. He was covered in feces and urine. Uh, he, was, he was mentally ill. He had schizophrenia. But one of the things that they did to him, other than not give him his meds, is also not give him water. And um, that leads to some of the things that, you know, in the lawsuit that was filed by Khalif later, these are also allegations he made about them. Yeah, well, I was just thinking, you know, I've interviewed a lot of grown men who went into prison and I would say 90% of the people that I interviewed, when they come out, they have been 
treated for PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And I think that going in as a person who's mentally ill or going in as a vulnerable child, the effects of being in Rikers, being in prison, would be devastating. I can't imagine that a person could escape that circumstance without some kind of developing some kind of traumatic disorder. Yeah. And the, and the sad part is whether someone's innocent or guilty, they're still human beings. And I hope that as as awareness builds around all of this through all of our podcasts and through especially through this Spike documentary, that, that people will realize that they're still human beings and still need to be treated humanely. And it gets even more sad when we think about the fact that at Rikers Island, there's so many thousands of these people that haven't even been convicted. Well, speaking of the conditions uh, in Rikers, one of the most egregious abuses against inmates there that Khalif suffered very badly was solitary confinement. And I know, Brooke, you talk a lot about this and you've written about this. So a lot of states have what is called speedy trial laws. I'm not an attorney, but I, I've done a lot of research on this. And it requires a person's trial to start within a certain time. And so in New York, they have the ready rule. I'm doing air quotes that you can't see, which basically says that if you have a felony case that's not a homicide, you have to be tried within six months or your case can be dismissed. But the problem with that is that there are so many technicalities that can delay the process. Like with Khalif, he was in there for almost three years and almost two of those years were spent in solitary confinement off and on. And... I think that a trial that's supposed to be happen in less than six months and ends up taking over three years is devastating enough. But I think that having to spend two thirds of that time in solitary confinement is torture. And I was reading earlier and actually solitary confinement does meet the UN criteria for torture. So literally he was tortured for two years. And a lot of people who are in solitary confinement show like go downhill pretty rapidly. They have side effects like hallucinating or insomnia, paranoia, suicidal ideation, and so many others that that I, I don't understand how this is used. Yeah, I can't imagine spending 23 hours of my day in this, locked in this 12 by 12 or 12 by 7 foot cell, just thinking to myself and wondering when the hell I'm getting out of here. That in itself, I mean, I could go ahead and tell you, I would completely lose my mind. I, I would not be built for it. The thing is, I don't think anybody is. It's an awful thing. Yeah, especially when you add into that, there's you know, there's no windows. You, you don't even have any markers of time. There's probably no clock in your cell. There's no window to see when the sun's up and the sun's down. Yeah, time is irrelevant. It's just... Right. You're just here. What will happen is, in many instances, when somebody is incarcerated for something, they're awaiting trial, the smallest infraction can then turn into another charge against them. And it doesn't even have to be something that you would consider a crime. Ed Eights has in 18 years has an almost impeccable record, but the charges that he has on his record while he was in prison, two of them were for not shaving because the razors were giving him razor burn. And so he didn't shave and he was given a charge for that for insubordination to the guards. I think Adnan has spent a couple of months in solitary because of cell phone charges, but he had a cell phone when he wasn't supposed to. Uh, And it was like a month at a time or something. So thank God it wasn't too egregious and lengthy, but Still, be right. These are not like violent crimes we're talking about. Not shaving. This is unbelievable. I just, I just think in general that there's a, a long-term mental effect, this damage that it does to a person being in this 12 by 7 foot cell for 23 hours a, a day for, you know, days, months, and in this case, years. It just, I, I bet you just don't no longer feel like a, a human. You feel, I don't know what you feel like, but you're stripped of everything and you're just trapped inside your mind. I think it's bad for for everything. I, I don't think it does any good. I don't think that there's anything positive that can come out of it. So I don't think that it should exist, especially if you're not a threat to anybody in the, in the prison. It's one thing if you were, you know, you're stabbing people or something, or you're, you're dangerous. But if you're just a regular inmate, why put you through this mental torture? You know, you're already in jail. Well, and he was a teenager, so his brain was still developing, and the social skills and life skills that he should have been learning during that time, he wasn't. He was learning, you know, inappropriate social skills and life skills because of his environment. And I can't imagine it didn't have any lasting effect on his developing brain. I mean, look, it certainly did. You know, Khalif committed suicide. He was 
plagued by demons. And one of the things that's frustrating to me is the idea, and, and it's been, and I said, I saw it in the media. I remember when, when, yeah, he did, I remember when he committed suicide. And uh, I remember reading the, some of the reports about like mental illness. And, this, and I wanted to say, you know what? There were no reports of him having mental illness before he was incarcerated at Rikers. They destroyed and damaged him and then put him on the street and then said, oh, now he's got mental illness. And so he committed suicide. And that just, it just really, really makes me angry because that is completely taking away any responsibility for that young man's, the trauma he experienced and, and his death. He also didn't get any, by the way, you know, these people, when they are released, whether or not you've been in solitary confinement, there's a lot of healing that has to take place for people. And I'm sure, Brooke, you know this, having spoken to so many exonerees, the kinds of healing and emotional support they need, the kinds of mental health help they need after release. Uh, and then somebody who's experienced solitary, it must be a whole different level. Kane, I just want to turn to you now. You are a professionally, you're you're a filmmaker. You have a podcast, but you are a filmmaker. That's your background, and um, for the the rest of us, we aren't. So I, I'd love to get your uh, thoughts on this documentary as a production itself, and then maybe open up some questions to kind of like the ethics of producing this kind of work. Sure. Just want to say, first of all, the production value of this series is awesome. That to me immediately drew me in and had a bigger, more impactful effect on my um, understanding of the the bigger issues here and really drew me in. And I think that production value is extremely important when it comes to these sorts of documentaries and docu-series for listeners and viewers. I do think that media, I mean, like, look, having my, what, ex, what I've experienced in the last few years and Bob, you too, and, and Brooke, you too. I mean, like, yeah, it can have a tremendous impact on people's lives in a positive way and even raising awareness on issues at the same time there's kind of a fine line right i mean there is media coverage that can be exploitive so how do you as a filmmaker make sure that you are doing something that's not just a creative entertainment type of product but actually has some meaningful impact well i mean my stance on the whole thing is you know people can argue that the entertainment aspect of these productions is exploiting a tragedy and stuff like that. But in general, I tend to completely disagree with that. If that's your argument, to me, you're basically saying that these sorts of documentaries should be of lower quality than what you see in a fictional show like Law and Order or something like that. I think that the production quality, the suspense, the gripping narrative, these are all pivotal in these types of documentaries in order for them to be effective. The bigger goal of these things is awareness. So to tell these stories, you have to tell it in a way that will resonate with people. Um, they need to see it in a way that, that they're going to establish an emotional connection with it. And you know, a great example of that is my podcast, Up and Vanished. I spend a lot of time in creating a, a suspenseful atmosphere and a really riveting sort of storyline. In my experience so far, I've had a couple, just a few negative criticisms about it being overproduced or sensationalized. but. I would say that for the most part, the really large majority are actually more into the podcast and the awareness of the story about this missing woman in my podcast is much, much larger. And I think that the goal of my podcast is, is to solve a cold case. So the outreach is bigger and with a larger audience because of these things. So the chances we have of finding some sort of resolution and achieving the underlying goal of the whole thing you know, is much larger. And I've never made a documentary, but I've made a lot of podcasts. And I think that knowing the kind of connection that you have to make with the people that you're interviewing or the people that you're working with, you don't make a production about like a cause without connecting with the victims. And I think that you have to form a connection with the family or with the victim or with whoever your your subject of your production is. And you don't do that if you're just in it for money or just in it for fame or just in it for entertainment. Right. And I, I think that's the key in what all of us are doing and what they did with the documentary is that in your case, Payne, you, you have an end goal. You're trying to accomplish something uh, j just like with Undisclosed with the Joey Watkins case and myself on Truth and Justice with that AIDS case. We're not just telling a story for the entertainment of it. We're trying to get somewhere. You know, I'm, I'm trying to not only get Ed AIDS out of prison but also to find the person that actually did it and put them in prison. That I think is what makes the difference. But I think what, cause I, cause I get the same thing. Every once in a while you get that hate mail that, 
you know, you're, you're exploiting and you're making money off of, sure. off of this person's death. But what people fail to realize exactly what you just said, in order for specifically what I do on truth and justice, you know, it's a crowdsourced investigation. You know, the listeners are participating and, and contributing, whether it be monetarily to, you know, to fund expert witnesses or expert testing and things like that. But in order to have the funding for me to be able to provide the investigative services for free to these families, there has to be funding. In order for there to be funding, there has to be an audience. And so you have to always, for me, it, it is always a struggle. Like, when am I going too far? But uh, I thought they, they hit it right down the middle with uh, with this documentary. And it's what I try to do every time on, on Truth and Justice, which is to make it produced well enough and entertaining enough to engage people, especially on that emotional level, like you mentioned, so that we have the support we need to accomplish the goal at the end. And without the audience being engaged emotionally, you're just not going to be able to accomplish the goal. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a fine line to toe, and I certainly think the entertainment, um, you know, I got this question a lot about Serial, that does it bother you that it was so entertaining? And I said, no, the entertainment had a utility, right? The entertainment had to be there to make sure you guys listen to this guy's story. It wasn't just you know, for nothing. And so, uh, but at the same time, like you said, pain, like the bigger picture here is getting actual movement in the facts of the case that you're working on. And so sometimes you have to do things like pull in celebrities like John Cryer and other things uh, to get the kind of attention you want. I mean, these are the kinds of things. Um, and I don't think it takes away from the actual work that's being done. So... Hi, Rabia here again, and I am joined with Bob Ruff as we get a chance to do something very cool. We're going to interview the executive producers and director of the documentary, Time, the Khalif Browder story. So we have with us today Julia Nason, who is a creator and executive producer of the series, and Jenner First, a Peabody Award winner who, along with also being an executive producer, is the writer and director of this documentary. Together, Jenner and Julia are founders of the New York-based production company, The Cinemart. And they come to this project after a long line of incredibly impressive and impactful documentaries, independent and feature films they've produced, including Brick City, Chicagoland, and Welcome to Leith, which, by the way, I recently saw on Netflix, and it was just fantastic. So, hi, Jenner and Julia. Welcome, and thanks for joining us. Hi, thanks for having us. Hi, thanks for having me. How are you doing today, Jenner and Julia? We're uh, we're hanging in there. You know, we're we're actually skyping in from the editing room. It's been quite a journey to finish the series, and we're we're deep, still very very deep in the um, the editing process. So uh, every day is a journey to um, get to the finish line here. Well, I want to get right into the the questions we have for you about the documentary. And the first thing that I want to know is, how did you get involved in this documentary? Of course, we had. You know, we read the New Yorker magazine, we read the New York Times and other publications here in New York. And the story was publicized even up until several years ago. I mean, people in New York knew about Khalif Bradder. People in New York knew about uh, the kind of really horrible conditions at Rikers Island. And I had read Khalif's story. Julia had read Khalif's story. And when Khalif passed, our partner, Nick Sandow, is also a creator and executive producer on the show. He kind of put it back in front of us and was just so moved by the whole uh, sort of tragic genesis of Khalif's life and what he had gone through. He, he just wanted to help. And he reached out to Khalif's attorney, Paul Prestia, offered himself, you know, Nick is the star of a show called Orange is the New Black. And over the years has be, been able to kind of understand mass incarceration from a unique standpoint and had come to the point in his, his career and his role on the show where he really wanted to make a change and do something with the position that he had found himself in as, as a warden on this you know hit show. So he just initially reached out to help and in talking with us, you know, knowing that we had this documentary background and Nick himself is also a filmmaker, you know, we said, well, what could we do here to make sure that this story never disappears from people's minds? You know, the evening news can carry a story only so far before it disappears out of the news cycle. You know, it's no longer in print. And, and we never can have that immortal historical record if it's only for the evening news and the, and the articles. You know, those things fade away. So 
the idea was to create a really impactful, epic saga because within Khalif Browder, we saw every single failing in the American justice system and also several other systems, the public education system, the foster care system, the mental health system, just so vast what his life signified. And so we embarked on this journey and, and gained the trust of, of his family. And uh, it's been quite a remarkable process and, and a harrowing period of our lives personally to work on it. How, how long have you been working on the documentary? We've been working on this for about a year and a half. Okay, so you actually began after uh, Khalif's death, is that right? Yes. Yeah, we, uh, we really began shooting within the first month after Khalif had passed and doing our initial interviews with Khalif's family who had you know, who was still grieving very intensely at that point. Of course. Did you have an opportunity to meet him directly and uh, speak with him before you began filming? No, and I, th I find that to be the most surreal part of this whole journey is I've gotten to know this young man so intimately through the accounts of others, but I myself have never met him, and neither is Julia or Nick, so... It's a very surreal thing to be doing, to be someone's biographer, to be chronicling someone's life and capturing their character uh, without ever sitting in a room with them or without ever, you know, being able to have a conversation that was more organic. So it's, it's really an interesting journey for us and pretty special and, and challenging, too, to, to make sure that you get the story right. Right. Yeah, this is a really personal story. And... Do either of you have any personal connection? I, I know not really to the case, but either through like similar or personal experiences or what motivated you to get involved? Well, I mean, for me personally, as a filmmaker and also for Julia, who, you know, we've worked together for almost 10 years now, uh, I've had a, a, the kind of privilege to be able to tell several stories about the war at home, about mass incarceration, about issues facing communities of color. And for me to be able to build on that body of work and for us as a company, you know, the cinema to be able to sink our teeth into such a robust tale of a young man who represented everything wrong with America, essentially, it just felt like we didn't have a choice. And we hope that America can share this same feeling that we have, which is uh, a very tragic, sad feeling when you look at what's happening in this country. By producing this documentary, you you were bringing and it brought a lot of awareness to Khalif's story. Do you guys have a plan or, or a hope? What do you hope to accomplish big picture with the series once it's over? Well, what's really quite amazing and also unprecedented is the level of support we've gotten from the network. You know, they don't do this every day, so they have a huge commitment to earning the trust of their viewer and capitalizing on the platform to make change in Khalif's name. So after every episode, which is going to be available in 100 million homes, uh, there'll be a call to action. And the call to action uh, will be geared towards each episode, you know, in episodes that deal with, you know, the bail system. Uh, There's some partners that um, are related to that effort and episodes that deal with solitary confinement are partners on that front. That's one way we can take this attention, take this moment, take the feeling we have when the show is over, which, you know, is not a clean feeling. It's, it's actually a very disturbed feeling to see up close and personal how dirty this whole system is and how reckless it is to human life. Well, you know, I think it's really tremendous that you're not just thinking of this, you know, as a documentary series, you're going to put it out there and then just let's see, let's see what happens if it moves people, but you actually have an advocacy plan, which is just a huge undertaking, but also, I mean, that's like the missing component in a lot of this kind of work. I have a question that, that has a slightly different angle, and that's this, uh, and I wonder about this, uh, having my own experience with, with, with Serial and Adon's case, how personally invested do you get? I mean, like, so, you know, you the other documentaries you made, and now this one, um, do you continue to remain connected to, like... The, the people in the lives that you cover, uh, are you still connected to, like, for example, Khalif's family? Like, how personally invested do you get and how hard is it not to be? I mean, I can imagine it's got to be very, very difficult to just kind of 
you know, be done with this project and then walk away and move on to the next one? Yeah, I mean, you know, you take kind of a, um, it's a form of service, you know, when you tell stories like this and the bonds that are created, the depth of those bonds and the kind of human connection that's formed, I feel like definitely extends way beyond the project itself. I am still in touch with subjects of films that I made in 2007. I still am intimately involved with the cast from Brick City. I still have a source in the south side of Chicago that texts me every week. Now you take that, which was, you know, important work we were all doing together, and now you put the Browders in the mix who essentially we met them, Julia and I met them when they were grieving. Julia sat with Vanita for hours at a time talking about her son. We sat with her their children for hours and hours and hours, day after day, week after week, when the spotlight burned out and no one else was watching. That's beyond just basic journalism. That's a, that's a familial bond. And of course, you know, um, things change and things get very surreal when their pictures are on the screen and, and this is now a TV show. But before people become cognizant that this is going somewhere. There's a therapeutic process to taking people's testimony and the bond created from that therapeutic process of speaking on camera, it transcends the project and it lasts for years, contemplatively forever. And I find myself on the kind of other end of the spectrum. Some journalists have created many boundaries, have created a whole practice for extracting stories that are this heavy. And I myself, I'm just out there, you know, wearing, and I feel Julia is the same way. You know, we're wearing our hearts on our sleeves. We're trying to be forthright and honest about everything we're trying to do and trying to be available emotionally for our subjects. And, you know, that comes with cost, but also comes with great honor. And I know that I will be connected with the Browder family forever because of this intimate portrait that we created together. That's wonderful. Yeah. And that's, that's a really difficult thing. And I know that uh, Robbie with Undisclosed just went through this and I'm just now going through this particular week as I'm closing up one case and moving on to another one. And I, and I understand exactly where you're coming from that I'm struggling emotionally letting go of one case and grabbing onto another and I'll forever be in the lives of Ed Aids and his family. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a difficult transition. So I, I admire everything you guys are doing. You too, guys. I mean, the work is really amazing. The work that you guys do on, on your podcasts, and we're honored to be on this program and to be with fellow storytellers who take the leap and, and take this stuff further so that people around the country can understand what's actually happening. Well, thank you for that. And in this, this last question I have, I want to ask specifically to Julia. We all know that when you're producing a series like this, you're limited by time slots, production schedules, et cetera. There's no way to get everything in that you'd like to. So what I want to know is what didn't we hear about in the documentary that you would like the world to know? That's an interesting question. I think that it's important to give people information that's digestible. So in a way, there's a dichotomy of I I have this non-sensation that I'm not getting enough in, but at the same time, that restriction is actually a gift because it helps people really hone into one aspect of the criminal justice system or the very intimate portrait of Khalif's mother. And that's something that people can attach themselves to on an emotional level that goes deep into the psyche of telling such a massive issue of injustice in this country. Well, thank you so much, both um, Jenna and Julia, for joining us. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing the entire series, which premieres on Wednesday, March 1st on Spike at 10 p.m. Good luck. Thank you guys so much. Thank really so appreciate much. this interview. It was really an, an honor speaking with both of you and i um, excited to uh, continue to listen to your work on the airwaves. Khalif's story is tragic and heartbreaking and deserves to be told, retold, and never forgotten. There are many, many more, many thousands more still stuck in the nightmare that Khalif experienced. And the point of media like this series, or like the podcast that we all represent, 
is to raise awareness of what is happening in the shadows of our society, to change the systematic injustices that many aren't even aware exist. Time, the Khalif Browder story, isn't just a compelling, beautifully made documentary series. It is a call to honor Khalif's life and a call to action for all of us. The series debuts on Wednesday, March 1st on Spike at 10 p.m. Don't miss it. None of us will.